you. Uh, thanks for hosting me, and uh, thanks for, uh, I would say, a pretty large turnaround. So uh, you can hear me well? OK. Um, so in our life, we basically, when we look around our environment, there are two critical elements that we depend on. And they are water as well as like plants. Unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, uh, they are not in their best condition, right? Uh, and one thing that like, you know, it doesn't matter on which side of the aisle we are in, uh, we do believe that protecting the environment is a priority, one way or other. There is a difference in approach, uh, but everyone agrees to that. And uh, to actually understand what is really happening, why it is happening, what kind of impact that we are seeing, and uh, how we can minimize like, you know, this and eventually uh, can get it to its pristine state, uh, we can see more and more proliferation of technology, especially electronic technology. This is an example where you can see that this uh, bio-logging system, which is used uh, for uh, sort of like, you know, the marine environment observation. These are variety of like, you know, the environmental monitoring system for agricultural productivity and to understand like, you know, the, how the plant environment and our ecology is working. Uh, and they are being built in both cases using a rigid and bulky, but traditional high performance integrated circuits or chips uh, as smart electronics. So over the last couple of years, like uh, these kind of electronics that we know for decades, uh, we have worked to come up with something and to transform these kind of electronics exactly to something like this, which essentially shows a fully flexible, physically compliant, uh, high performance electronic system uh, like this in my hand. Okay. So uh, today in my talk, I will be focusing on uh, two application areas uh, just to actually show that how we can use this kind of soft uh, like, you know, that uh, very compliant electronic system to interface with biology. And the reason is uh, that if you look at that all these biologies, they have asymmetric surfaces. They have uh, mostly like, you know, the soft tissues and other like, you know, the biological organs and elements. And as well as like, you know, that their geometry is quite uh, like, you know, the uh, interesting, like, you know, they are not exactly like, you know, they regularly shaped the way that the ICs they look like, right? So in both cases, what we have done is uh, they, we have made uh, the flexible version of overall system of both of these. So this is a, a, exactly on a stingray and this one is on uh, like, you know, the plants, these butterflies. So I'll be talking about these two. Uh, in context of their design criteria. First, I will talk about the main skin uh, and then the, their fabrication, uh, system integration, their deployment. And in one occasion that how we are trying to corroborate our work with uh, the computer scientists to bring artificial intelligence for the deployment. So why we would need to know about the marine environments and what are the elements that we need to know? So I would say that we need to understand the pressure and depth uh, because in this way we can, we will know about what's really happening, how is the habitability of the different species. Uh, if we know about the temperature, as you can see from starting from here, zero meter depth, when it goes to like on you know, the 10,000 meters, there is a huge drop just from euphotic zone until it goes to the abyssal zone, there is a big drop in context of temperature. And that is also associated and knowing that can help us to understand the global climate change. By knowing how the salinity and the temperature they are changing, what is going on in different geographic locations can actually tell us about the different way of the ocean current circulation, their dynamics, 
uh, and potentially how they can be harmful uh, for our own existence even. Uh, and if you look like what's the solution today, so it's being used like you know, as telemetry tax, but there are needs to have some sort of boundary conditions. So the accepted maximum width for this kind of sensors should be not be more than 1% of the overall body weight of this kind of species. So you can say that these two examples are essentially the wearable for non-human. But if you look like, you know, that these are like, you know, the bulky, they're heavy, around like two and a half kgs, even their lightweight one, they're fairly expensive, more than $1,000 per unit. And often they are being invasively attached. So when these species, when they're carrying this kind of bulky, as well as invasively attached uh, biologging system to them, they really do not show the mobility they would have shown without this kind of cumbersome technology, right? Now, a disclaimer, I'm neither a swimmer nor eat fish, but I do really get uh, like I'm affected by when I see uh, like this kind of living, uh, like on the species, they are in some sort of pain. So uh, this is one of the another examples. This is a hard shell turtle, and this is uh, from a Red Sea. Like you know that I wish I could have gone there and see that. Like you know, but these are the photos that my colleagues they actually collected, and this is actually one of the uh, rescue, uh, like you know the uh, per personality who was looking and searching for the Malaysian Airlines when it uh, got missing. Right, so there. It went somewhere in this, uh, like in the Indian Ocean, in such a depth where the human technology even cannot reach. But there are potentially the species who live there and they can go there, right? So we accepted a challenge nearly three years back that can we make uh, the animal, uh, like you know, the comfort and movement accommodating with the technologies? Uh, can we actually dramatically reduce the weight even by 40 times? So assuming uh, two, two kgs, and if I add, like divided by 40, then it's actually a lot of reduction. And can we actually have a performance over cost improvement nearly by 10 times? So let's say, can we do it in $100 or not? And then a complete physical compliancy, and at that some point, integrate the data processing, the both the logic and the memory in the same uh, system. So we started working on that uh, and showing the first, like on the, the, in the third slide, as I mentioned, that we are kind of, we have uh, come up with heterogeneous integration strategies to uh, like, you know, the make this kind of very compliant, like you know, the overall uh, CMOS electronic system without, and using silicon, not using the conventional uh, flexible material systems like organic or like one dimensional or two dimensional material system. But we are very open, we use them often in opportunistic manner. So uh, using this, like you know, that we uh, integrated temperature sensor, pressure sensor, as well as salinity sensor. And uh, the reason that we do have this kind of like, you know, the stretchable or fractal design, because at some point, if a species which is a smaller in size right now, but going forward, if they're wearing it for one year and they're growing, then we would like to actually have the opportunity so that the overall system also grows with them, okay? We also had this like, you know, the pressure sensor that they are uh, pretty easy to make in context of like, you know, having two uh, metallic plates with an insulating material in between. So whenever there is some sort of pressure uh, between them, then we can know the capacitor. Uh, also, like you know, the based on the continuity of or like the conductivity of the two material system, uh, which is e like you know the affected, which gets affected easily by salinity. Uh, that's also somehow we can know about the salinity. Okay. So eventually, the, our first system it became comfortable because it's a compliant design. It's non-invasive because you can attach it pretty easily. It has multi-sensory, as I mentioned, and the weight was reduced to two and a half grams. This is a, this actually you can see like, you know, that from that two kg where we are reducing it. 
I know that at some point there will be a question that how we did that. So I'll go through that. There is low cost approach because the overall material cost was reduced to only $20 or a little less. Okay? And then there's, there's like, you know, we made it make sure that the overall system is completely encapsulated with the waterproofing system so that except the sensor part which, is, which needs to be exposed, and every other elements, like you know, the, these data processing units as well as the memory with this battery, they are fully packaged and uh, there is no water leaking there. But at the same time, to find out the polymeric encapsulation, which is biocompatible, because uh, we are talking about preservation of the environment, at the same time we are throwing a bunch of electronics, as well as like, you know, the, the polymeric encapsulation, we have to be careful about that. So, and then there was the question of that, okay, what are the other things that we were doing? So we had also come up with two centimeter by one centimeter, which is very small. We used a conventional coin cell battery initially for power supply, but we made sure that the battery lifetime is up to one year. It's obviously depending on the sampling frequency. In these cases, we are not collecting the information uh, pretty rapidly. And we had this uh, Bluetooth technology, and why is that? Underwater, it cannot transmit the data. So there is something that we had to do, that we had to really fetch it after it's uh, been uh, worn by a species, and then uh, to get the data out in our smart devices or laptops without connecting it directly, rather uh, using that BLE or the Bluetooth technology. But what it could is, whenever it's sensing, it could log as well as store the data underwater because we do have this logic and uh, like you know, the memory unit there. So what is really happening, we do have this pressure sensor that we fabricated. We had the temperature sensor that also we fabricated. And then there was this like, you know, the Bluetooth chip that we got it from different sources. It's just the reason is it's very complicated to fabricate that in an university fab. And then we had this flash memory device. So all these data that they are going there, they are being preserved. And whenever it's being taken out, then it just transmits the data to your smart devices or your laptops, okay? So now this is actually the, our first demonstration. This is a blue crab. It's, it's a, a pretty normal, like, you know, the habitat in the Red Sea area. So the reason that we took it, because it has a hard shell, and they go inside both the sand as well as in the water. Uh, and uh, you can see like, you know, it's a very conformal and seamless attachment. And this is like, you know, the different polymeric material that we used. And this was done in Valencia this year in January, Spain. Uh, so this is uh, basically a shark where uh, we use like, you know, the, for enamel, uh, for dental enamel, there are some kind of adhesives. So we use it actually on this one. And you can see, uh, so this is a shark. It has a name, uh, don't know exactly, remember. Uh, but it is actually wearing this. And when the data has been collected, we fetched it. And this is with the big battery. So actually like, you know, for longer time of deployment and gathered the data out of it. Now you see that most of the species where they will be within the 200 meters or in the close to the surface area, water surface, some of them they can actually go really, really like you know in the deeper area like two meter, even like uh, four kilometer or two kilometers, right? So we really wanted to actually know about like you know that whether these species can wear these or even our uh, like on you know, the prototype can even be functional down to two kilometer depth or not. So we, we do have Red Sea Research Center where they are very well equipped in addition to carry out like you know the main research in the actual Red Sea and in other places uh, where they can simulate exactly the same pressure that can, we can feel when it goes to two kilometer depth or even 1.5 kilometer depth and so on and so forth. So what we used, we used our pressure sensor because every time it's going down, we can see like, you know, that 
the capacitance was going up. And the reason is there because of the pressure, these two plates were getting closer. And obviously, the capacitance was going up. So it was functional up to four weeks continuously uh, with even at a depth of 1.5 kilometers. If you look at the salinity measurement, we use like you know the very low cost material system and that's exactly where we started using like you know the reducing the price down. Because copper is cost effective as well as very sensitive to salinity. So if you look at like you know, salinity actually varies uh, quite a lot like you know from Pacific Ocean versus Red Sea. And at the same time, we also use like some emerging materials to see like you know that how they're effective and compatible with our system. And uh, that was actually used for pH sensing. And these are different kind of like, you know, the, uh, the liquid where its pH values are different. And it shows that it can identify like you know, the, with uh, selectivity. So now I'm going to actually show you that when we carried out our, uh, the experiment in uh, Valencia, then we realized that some of these species that it's not actually good for them to have the adhesion because it can be some of them they shed their skin like dolphin some of them they actually like you know, it can be injurious eventually for longer time use for their skin so we decided that uh, why we are not coming up with something like you know the this kind of uh, the belt where uh, someone can actually use it and uh, the this kind of fishes we can let them wear it like as if they're wearing a wristwatch or something like that. Uh, it's gonna, it's a slow motion video because we wanted to actually make sure that uh, it's clearly, uh, we can watch it. And you can see like, you know, that when we are doing it, it can be done without using any kind of glue or adhesion. It's just a small mushroom button, just placed it in. And then you see that when we release the fish, it's actually moving without any kind of challenge because it's not even feeling. It's two grams plus some extra because of this band itself. Okay. So now, then, uh, like you know, that we also figured out that there are species which can be quite different, like stingray. So in this stingray case, we realize that there is unless we actually place it on its uh, tail then we most probably have to do something like this, uh, which is uh, not exactly the glue. So we have been uh, working with like, you know, the, some polymer chemistry group who can support us with like, you know, the more biocompatible, like you know, the jelly, gel O system. So essentially like you know, the, when, this, uh, when this is being placed and then we are gonna release it and you will see like, you know, that it's actually what, like you know, the living fine. And as of today, as far as I know that this Stingray is in good shape, good health. This is much, much better at that. Yeah. Um, so now this system is also being used. Uh, we have deployed in Bahamas on some of the wild sharks. Uh, we have some of our collaborative partners. And then you will see here that on the small fishes also, but they have some sort of like, you know, the uh, hard shell. Uh, you will just keep watching on this uh, specific one. It will come out, come, come around, and then you will see that there is a small tag uh, attached to it. And here is the tag. Okay. Uh, it, it actually, as of today, it is uh, living in our lab uh, without any challenge. And there is this, uh, like you know, the tag is uh, there on its, uh, like on you know, the shell. So anyway. Now the question is that like, you know, uh, how really it compares with the existing technology. So these are different technologies which you can buy off the shelf from the market. And as you can see, like, you know, the, from the depth, temperature, salinity, uh, these are the common, uh, like, you know, the stimuli that these uh, tags are trying to sense. And we also actually incorporated all of these in the same singular platform. From a size perspective, obviously, like you know, that how we can reduce the size, and today we have two and one centimeter. Height is obviously like you know, because we are using very thin film uh, as well as like encapsulation material, everything is much thinner, and more importantly, the silicon 
uh, like you know the accessories are also thin enough so these are all like you know the within a very small thickness and the weight is obviously very impressive to us and if you look at like you know the from the based on the the tag deployment lifetime that it's very like you know the reasonably actually like you know the very well suited one and the fastest possible sampling in context of like you know because we are using high performance cmos electronics so we can actually do it at a much faster pace but if we actually go with this kind of speed then obviously like you know the battery lifetime is going to be reduced because obviously it's transmitting like on you know, the collecting the data and the overall the cmos is working you know much harder so to summarize on the first portion of this talk what we have done is like you know that this is like marine skin we call it this is a harsh environment marine conditions it's a multifunctional sensory system where we can uh, sense the temperature depth salinity it's also being recorded in its memory device it's a very scalable design it's a comfortable and non invasive also very lightweight and the small system footprint a low power and continuously functional at 1.5 km depth for 4 weeks uh, as well as there are ongoing activities after we demonstrated that i'm going to pass around like you know that uh, one of these systems so that uh, uh, please uh, be a little bit like you know the careful about it hold on a second so um, it's actually the systems okay. so currently we are working on like you know the producing uh, a mass a much uh, larger number of units uh, because uh, there are a couple of organizations that they are very interested uh, so this is we exhibited that in the this year CES. Uh, currently, we are also adding some capabilities like oxygen and carbon dioxide sensing. We are working with UC San Diego and UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I'm also actually uh, working on like you know having uh, overall photo detection so that uh, wherever the species they go, so we can gather like you know the what's really happening surrounding it. Uh, as well as like you know the adding the motion pattern detection that's what's happening right now in Bahamas uh, as well as like you know all this data collection we do have this visual computing center so they are doing big data analysis to recreate the overall uh, like you know the marine environment where this uh, the species with this kind of skin has roamed around uh, as well as the real-time communication plus geo positioning so we are working with uh, Stanford Hopkins one of my former students who initially worked on that so uh, she is now the research scientist there uh, and that's supported by Gordon Moore Foundation uh, and going forward I look forward to actually working on something which is uh, on monitoring the physiology of the main species okay so now from water we will come back to the land uh, and uh, why is that as you know like you know with the global population the way that it's rising still one out of eight people they suffers from chronic hunger one in three children faces malnutrition in developing countries and to actually provide and to feed them we are more and more uh, we are going for enhanced agricultural productivity at the cost of the forest so annual net forest loss is nearly like seven million hectares so the question is is it possible to halt defrostration as well as increasing the agricultural productivity now here is the catch there are five crops we eat normally consume rice uh, wheat uh, barley like you know the sugar cane uh, and corn but the problem is that only uh, in small percentile areas in the whole world that they are being grown there are many areas which are like sub-saharan countries and other places the plants are just need to be stress tolerant okay and to do so like you know that uh, there are these kind of electronic technologies are being used especially using UAVs uh, automated like you know the water watering as well as understanding like you know the it's uh, the chemistry of the soil uh, as well as their data collection and and a combination of these so based on this there are different kind of like you know the monitoring system for the microclimate uh, like you know the understanding are available and if you look at so this one these are the one that you can buy pretty much from Amazon 
like you know so this is the one which can do the temperature and humidity sensing as well as the solar radiation sensing essentially this is a solar cell uh, you can do the wind flow sensing this is the one where you can actually look at like you know the different kind of uh, what's going on the sunlight sensing uh, like you know, the fertilizer sensing the chemistry this is the hydration and it costs nearly $25 per square feet to have a greenhouse, right? And in the greenhouse, you can have a limited number of plant samples, and then you use expensive technologies to actually monitor them, right? So the idea was that can we actually come up with very low cost, like, you know, the compliant sensory system, which can uh, be deployed like you know in mass and can gather the data and can provide us with the similar information from a design perspective we needed to actually work with the, its different mechanical functionality like soft structure for its compliance uh, we had to use a wrinkle material system uh, like you know metal for pre stain polymer so that there is like you know the strain uh, like you know, with fractal design so it can be stretched uh, as well as like you know they have to be hydrophobic packaging and obviously low cost and biocompatible material system so after much thought like you know so I decided that why we are not using this butterfly shape now aesthetically it's beautiful but at the same time if you look very carefully we need actually its wings have a lot of spaces so we can have different kind of sensors like you know the pretty easily like you know the integrated and butterfly is something which is actually like you know the, these plants they're very uh, like you know familiar with it's not that they're going to actually like you say that i don't want this sensor because it looks like an elephant but you know it's actually like you know the has a lot of like on you know, the area efficiency so we started working on three different kind of sensor the temperature humidity and the growth sensing some of these like you know these um, uh, the plants uh, even with like you know the salinity changing you can see their impact how they're growing how their leaves are opening like you know all those kind of things and then for the system integration perspective so we we accepted a minimalist approach to reduce the ICs uh, and how we are doing it I always keep saying this that you know a a commoner, a daily person may not actually need to know about their blood pressure exactly what it is right now. But what they really need to know that am I fine today or is it approaching somewhere that I need to go to the clinic and to get it checked, right? So when we actually can reduce our expectation, we can uh, actually make it a little modest then we may not need to use all the complex circuitry. And in this way, we can minimize the use of ICs and we can use only the bare number of the circuitry. And in this way, this can also actually give us, without any doubt, like, you know, we can save even 99%, it's experimentally proven. We are mini making it low cost. And then because we know how to actually make them physically compliant, this kind of circuitry, so this is a pretty small footprint, and then we use even this micro lithium ion battery. That also is flexible. And with a sampling rate of two seconds, we could do, and we have done it for nearly six months of logging. And it's very lightweight, and the leaf texture can also vary widely. Because if you look at, if I would like to actually have it on a tomato, <coughs> like you know, the plants, the tomatoes have some whiskers, right? So I cannot actually shave it to have like, you know, the, to get it around, right? So, but at the same time, we can play with the fabrication so that we make it porous so that the whiskers can naturally grow without any challenge. So again, the system has minimal number of ICs and you will see that this system and the one that has the main species one, they're quite similar, okay? So this is actually also another trick uh, from integration perspective that you have something which is a core and then to branch it out like you know as part of the application itself we cannot have something completely universal but we can get to a point where uh, like you know that uh, it can be uh, absolutely the bare bone one so these are some of these like you know that uh, the example as you saw in the first hand like you know that when they are sitting and they can collect the data 
uh, and these are standalone system because uh, in situ power supply is very important. Now, because there is no bulky ICs, we have reduced their thickness. So we have also done like you know the solar and wind power because these plants with the wind uh, flowing, they actually move a lot. So there is piezoelectric energy harvesting. They are always because of photosynthesis. They are looking at the sunlight, so we can get a lot of like you know solar energy. And going forward, I think the question would be that can we make them biodegradable? So the question is that we are in the process of uh, transforming all these material system into something which is like you know biodegradable or more environmentally friendly. But with the current demonstration, as you can see, uh, we used like you know the commercial sensors that I just uh, showed in a couple of slides back, and to compare that like you know the fabricated sensors, and again like you know the main objective is not to have the best possible sensor. Main objective first to have an integrated system and then whoever has the best sensor to integrate that there. You can see like you know that it can actually monitor the temperature pretty consistently nearly as same as the commercial sensor as well as like you know that when you look at uh, humidity profiling it is exactly following the trend of an off the shelf commercial sensor. So, you can say clearly like you know that they are doing a very decent job. So now the question is that how we are going to monitor the plant growth. So what we are doing is like taking a polymeric encapsulation, pre-straining it, and then to have like you know the gold or copper based on exactly gold sometimes is mostly like you know that it doesn't get oxidized pretty quickly, copper gets it. It depends on for how long we would like to use it and the, in context of the uh, cost also. And then we encapsulate and we keep it uh, on the way like in you know, the where we can see like you know the plants can potentially grow like this is some a barley plant and as you can see that when we actually uh, use a saline water so that we could monitor the growth rate because when it's growing at the same time this pre-strained material system that's also getting elongated. So the, with this elongation is getting captured <laughs> by its resistance change and that is what we are measuring. So, growth rate is like 2.7 millimeter per day or we also tried it on like you know the bamboo tree lucky bamboo because you can see like you know that the total elongation is like you know the it is like in the micron level. So, compare these two obviously they are two different kind of like you know the, the plants, but their growth rate can be different even even when we have like you know applied the same kind of stimuli. Okay, so the then next question is that how we can deploy them like you know the, a lot, right? So this why I had a student from the mechanical engineering, like you know, so he worked on this. It's called a zero fuel because it does not require any kind of like you know the uh, extra fuel or battery or something like that. We called it plant copter. Here you can see like you know, the inside it there is like you know the all the batteries and the electronics that is required, but outside are only the sensors and they nearly look like the one that someone can build it using like you know even cutting the paper. So dragging was a huge concern because of the weight like you know so we had to work on that and so we coupled these two in a closed loop feedback system to come up with the modeling first before we went to the design. And then uh, like you know, we used like 3D printing technology to actually have additive manufacturing to do this kind of like you know, demonstration. So I'm gonna run in parallel two videos. Here we have this like you know the interface software. So whenever we're gonna drop it, uh, it actually starts collecting the data, you will see it. And at the same time, like you know, that when you are dropping it like you know in the fields, that what you can expect, they are gonna just because of the breeze, it just goes and then it falls. Sometimes like you know this is a small area like you know, they are going to fall in here, but when we are talking about the large areas that they should be like you know the where they are supposed to be. Now someone has to carry that and that is why like you know that we are working with this one. So essentially what is really happening here, it is a part of these UAVs. So there is no human interfacing here, no one is actually. Uh, flying them with the remote controller. It knows about a certain terrain, but it just does not know where is the mustard plants, where are the rose bushes, where is the, like, you know, the blue river. 
but they are different color. There is yellow, there is red, there is blue. If it goes, it does a color detection, in this case on the green fields, and then drops a sensor. So this actually is a mechanical system that we designed. So this uh, one is detecting this uh, green color, like, you know, on its own, making its, uh, like, you know, the decision there. And then based on that, it's releasing it. And if you look very carefully when it's being dropped here, so this is the system which actually is like a pulley system. Whenever uh, like when it has sense, it has its own in situ chip, which is actually making the decision and giving it the command that, okay, release the pulley, like, you know, and it's releasing, and then all these sensors that they are being gonna be dropped. Now, this is a first version, and I'm pretty sure that obviously that this kind of technology will get better and better either through us or someone else, like, you know, but this actually shows the future that we can envision where we can have, like, you know, that this kind of electronics technologies proliferating in places where they were not actually considered going to be an integral part. To summarize this, like, you know, that we say that physically compliant electronics can actually be a great uh, enabler for agricultural productivity enhancement. Our current demonstrations show the temperature, humidity, and growth monitoring. Uh, we have shown like in the standalone system with battery and data management. Uh, and we are deploying like you know, the different uh, mechanism, different uh, techniques, uh, including like you know, the, uh, taking assistance from plant copters. And currently we're working on like you know, adding more functionalities like acoustic sensing, biodegradation, uh, study the plant biology. And now good thing is like you know, there are we do have this uh, uh, the plant biology center like in the, which they are very helpful with us and wide ranging deployment cost effectiveness and simplified monitoring having said that this is where i will conclude my talk today i would like to acknowledge my past and present group members at least two of them are here uh, and then like you know our collaborators uh, without them we couldn't have done something like you know the knowing about the main environment or like you know the uh, the plant biology or whatever we are learning. Uh, the grant agencies, obviously, like, you know, even being in the outside of the country, we have been fortunate to receive uh, many industrial grants and they're still sup uh, supporting us. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, their contribution. So I will stop here. Thank you so much for listening and we'll be happy to take more questions. Um, since it is, uh, first of all, a great talk, wonderful, it was uh, very inspiring. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought about opportunities for kind of citizen science, if it does, uh, these sensors on these animals do communicate over Bluetooth, are there opportunities for uh, people at an aquarium or people on the beach who see this stingray or whatever it may be close to the shore with this sensor, have you thought about if there are opportunities for them to use their devices to kind of learn information about the animal? Uh, yes, we are stepping up in that direction. Uh, like, you know, we are working with the American Diving Association also, like, you know, because the divers, when they dive and go for snorkeling and others, like, you know, that can be used. And that's exactly where we are doing these 2,000 units, like, you know, the, so something like that. Tomorrow, I'm scheduled to give a talk in Blom Center at 11 o'clock. Well, I'll not be talking about any of this. I have something else. I will show a model how we are actually integrating like, you know, the people from diverse uh, geographic location and then like, you know, the combining the ideas and then to disseminate that into different like, you know, the geographic locations. So my vision is to take the electronic technology and to make this kind of technology more like open sourcing. Not it's the computer code, it's also that, okay, so we are making these videos, we are posting them, right? So we are telling them, okay, so this is the dimension that someone needs to use, and this is the material that we have used. But at the same time, we are telling, as an example, in Nepal, you can use this material because it's very handy and easily available in your community, okay? So hopefully, when we have, we are much more connected world today, so we will see more and more ideas fostering, right? At the same time, like, you know, that people are more integrated uh, to provide solution uh, like you know, the, like globally, even for a local cause. Okay, thank you. In, in the marine environment, uh, one of one of your future plans was position uh, determination, 
geoposition determination. Correct. Uh, and I w I'm wondering, it, it sort of looks as, is there any way of keeping, keeping providing some kind of geopositioning from just blowing your power and weight budgets? And, and 100% uh, like you know so we have uh, recently I mean, can you use Loran or something like that with cheap receiver small receivers I think uh, like that that's obviously the consideration right now we have uh, secured like you know the uh, the GPS module which is not exactly the standard one which is going to be more functional within that kind of aqua environment and that's pretty bulky okay uh, so right now, what is our objective is like you know first to have that and to use it in a medium size like you know the the like bluefin tuna. Stanford Hopkins, they're working on that. Bluefin tuna is actually pretty large. Okay, so when we have a better idea how it works and what is really inside, then we will be able to actually not only miniaturize but we really would like to make it like you know, completely flexible. And the way that we do it is volumetric reduction. Not only lateral space, but also weight reduction and other techniques, okay? So that's why exactly we hope that going forward in two to three years, that it, we will be in a much better situation in context of reducing like you know, the overall budget, not only from its weight as well as volume, but also the power consumption. Like, you know, that uh, there was a time when, you know, that uh, when I graduated from UT Austin, so my, I was one of the first students who came up with a thesis which had the word title nano, 2005. So I always say about nano is something, why something, someone needs something small? Because small means that you will need much less material. It's gonna be much lightweight. It can move faster, that's why, right? Uh, like you know and it's going to be more sensitive because it's gonna it's a small footprint much less weight and everything is much smaller will also have much less power consumption so just even if you go by the textbook definition that's the overall objective of scaling down so yes this is a complex problem and uh, but at the same time without geopositioning it remains as like in the half baked so that's why it's like, you know, and obviously no technology is like, you know, the perfect, it's an optimal solution. So we'll have to go uh, compromise some and to gain some. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for coming. What are your current ideas on making the skins biodegradable? Uh, yes, uh, so the initial idea is like, you know, that uh, to basically the question is that, um, First, not to use anything which is environmentally toxic. So that's number one. Second, the, you know that if you look at silicon, right, which is uh, one of the dominant materials here, right? If you keep silicon in water, then maybe based on the thickness and the size, 80 years after, it will be gone, okay? So the question is that, are we looking for expedited, like, you know, the dissolution or biodegradation, or we are looking for something which is uh, like you know, in rapid, okay? Um, and in that context, what we are doing is like, you know, as I said, is identifying like you know, the analogous material, analog material which can actually provide, which can still give us the same functionality or nearly same functionality, but it can be biodegraded pretty quickly, but at the same time, not too much, and here is the reason. Let's assume that we would like to keep it functional for one year, right? So uh, we are working with the polymer scientists. So they are actually, they have given us some really good, like, you know, the, the samples, which actually shows that, okay, after one year, it will start to dissolve itself, right? So it has, obviously, it's not the click that it starts. There is a gradual, like, you know, the thickness reduction, and they are doing it in layer by layer. So after the first layer, it's gonna be like, you know, taking six months. The next layer is gonna take three months. But when it reaches to the state, then one year is complete, it's com gone pretty quickly, okay? So it's a lot of like in the material science involved there. And obviously also in marine environment, uh, based on the salinity and also there are like, you know, the other chemical constituents that can also potentially help, okay? So that's why like, you know, that uh, it's a long answer for a very good question, but that is the situation in context of like, you know, coming up with a solution which is sustainable.
Thank you. All righty. Um, thank you, Professor Mohammed, for coming in and speaking at the Citrus Research Exchange. OK, thank you so much. Uh, my office is in Cori 501. And uh, you can find me most of the time there. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you so much again.